thanks so much for having on the podcast. Just so the audience knows, who are you and what do you do? <laughs> thanks so much for having me, Brandon. It's uh it's so delightful to be here and to continue uh, dialogue with you. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a loaded question, and it's a question I often ask others. You know, who are you, and what's your story? Um, and I think I've gotten to a point where I feel like I don't need a story, and I, mm -hmm. I am. You know, and mm -hmm. and that's a journey in and of itself. Um, in a more traditional way, I guess uh, yeah, I consider myself a little bit of a. Um, I know a lot. About, uh, a little about a lot, a lot. <laughs> if, that, if that makes sense. Um, and so I, I, I consider myself a generalist. And as a generalist, I dabble in, you know, um, artificial intelligence, technology, behavioral science, marketing, neuroscience, group um, dynamics, mm -hmm. and then looking at art, creativity, innovation, mm -hmm. um, the future of humanity, the history of wisdom. That's a real mm -hmm. keen interest for me in terms of where we are now in mm -hmm. space and time and where we're headed as we build civilization. So in a nutshell, I mean, I'm still uh, becoming and mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a great way I think of starting a conversation next mm -hmm. time you meet somebody to just say, who are you and what's your story? Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's touching on a lot of things like the fact you're a journalist. I'm myself a journalist. And I think one of the greatest, funny enough, books about being a journalist is I think it's called The Range or just Range and really speaks to the mm -hmm. benefits of knowing a little bit about a lot. That's how I also tend to describe myself when meeting people. So Obviously, you touched on you know AI and and you know, you know the future of humanity to some extent, but over the past month we saw a huge rise in the chat AI, chat GBT, really being able or some people thinking you know this is taking everything away. Humans are no longer creative. This very extreme response to to some extent it is amazing technology, but also it's just a Google search to some extent, taking the most common knowledge and kind of dissimulating it and presenting it to who, the user. Where, when this all started, like when AI was becoming a thing, and you, like you said, kind of focusing more maybe from the your previous experiences or kind of looking at it even through some of an art landscape, was it initially scary to you? Were you thinking like, well, you know, art and our AI can't go together? Or were in, or in the early days, did you kind of see the Co commingling of it or how did that how did that whole start because i feel initially like anything new with the your have a course you know there's horses and then there's cars you always have the fear of the new but it seems like now you're really a part of that movement so how did it all start was it fear at first or was it confusion and kind of how did your mind shift change or what made it change that's a brilliant question, Brendan. And, uh, you know, not at all. It wasn't fear. It was um, an overarching sense of curiosity, just mm -hmm. pure curiosity and wonder and thinking, what if and how mm -hmm. and when and who? And, you know, I've been, um, I, I think about a brave new world. And I think what we're doing is we're entering a braver new world. And I think AI is uh, nothing to be feared, if anything, to be embraced and to be looked at as a tool to augment human creativity, human wisdom, human connectivity. There's, of course, a lot of, you know, caveats to, mm -hmm. to, to keep in mind. And I think technology access, digital literacy, um, data privacy, data storage, mm -hmm. uh, they're now, you know, um, their servers being, there's plans to put servers on the moon um, in, in, in the ground because mm -hmm. we've run out of space here in the cloud. And there's issues, I think, that we need to pay attention to the bioethics and the use of intergenerational data. So your children, and my children and our grandchildren, what will um, their data uh, rights be? So those are some of the questions. But in terms of creativity, I think it's um, we're on the on the cusp, moving out of the Renaissance, the second Renaissance into post humanism and this era of um, embryonic technological age where I think we just need to think about, you know, the parallels of our ethical and moral mm -hmm. development, um, if, if uh, that makes sense in terms of, you know, the application of AI and then the long-term uh, 
uh, impact. So yes, mm -hmm. great. Let's, you know, when I think about your question, I think about two things. One is um, computational creativity. So how do we augment human creativity with the use of AI? Um, and that brings us to data sets and data integrity and, you know, how we're mining and uh, creating um, reinforced machine learning, generative learning. Um, and then the other part of it is uh, looking at the, I think, impact of um, AI on how we perceive reality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what reality tunnels we get into, the epistemic bubbles, and we're, we're now kind of moving in digital herds. You know, we've created these digital uh, communities, and the impact uh, long-term is that when the internet, you know, the first computers, the ENIAC, and uh, mm -hmm. when, when the first um, the computer scientists, you, did you know computers were initially uh, a reference to women who were really good at math? Um, I did not know that. That's an yeah. interesting fact. And so uh, the ENIAC, the first computer, took up a huge room. And where mm -hmm. we're at now, you know, with nanotechnology and microchips, we're looking at staggering advances in innovation. Mm -hmm. um, I think we need to be mindful of potentially creating a subspecies, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I think about the bioethics of Bionics, so a company mm -hmm. that created an artificial eye um, to allow people to see, and they faced uh, bankruptcy uh, mm -hmm. a few years later, and people were left with a defunct eye. So those are some of the mm -hmm. concerns that I have about the long-term impact of the creativity um, uh, needing to be coupled with bioethics. Mm -hmm. And that's what's interesting you touched on the fact was the fact that access to this information is obviously so important as well. You know, as a civilization, as a group of people, advancing is great. But if it's going to increase the divide in the sense that the people who have access to this technology now, instead of just walking places, for example, now they can drive places at the same speed difference because the speed of AI and the speed of creativity and innovation, especially on the access to information front with this new, these newer technologies and what kind of what the future holds, if you don't have access to it, now you're much farther behind. You don't have the internet at your fingertips, like people say, or the the knowledge base of all the previous generations combined. And that even, and I guess what you're saying as well, especially on the even bio front, when you have, let's say, a tech, like the cl classic thing you always hear about Neuralink, the idea that, hey, we're going to in insert your, the ability to think computer in your, in your head or your brain to really connect you to the internet, you becoming one, what happens if you don't pay now or you can no longer afford it? It turns almost to that um, Justin Timberlake movie where you have to pay with time. Like it gets very, like you said, the ethics becomes a slip, not slippery slope, but very difficult to think of on these and these senses. Now taking someone's car, very upsetting. Can't, you know, they can't go to work, can't really participate in the same way within society. And there's a lot of systemic issues from that. But think about now we, you're turning off your brain almost. That's, such yeah, a bigger think, picture. Mm -hmm. Totally. I, I, I think where, where I'm thinking is, mm -hmm. you know, uh, 10, 20, 30 years down mm -hmm. the road where we've outsourced our memory capacity, our RAM, mm -hmm. if you will. Mm -hmm. And what we've done is uploaded uh, a lot of personal data. And the question is how this data is being mined, you know, mining huge data sets and the access to technology. I'm thinking of, you know, developing countries that mm -hmm. are still struggling with electricity and access to clean uh, water. And so what that creates then, what I'm uh, mm -hmm. seeing is a digital aristocracy. And this mm -hmm. digital aristocracy has immense power and has immense responsibility, as Spider-Man says, <laughs> with great power comes yeah. great responsibility <laughs> to, to you know, be mindful of how we're curating the next generation of thinkers, learners. Mm -hmm. And my concern with Neuralink um, is less so about the payment, a little bit mm -hmm. more about the software upgrades and mm -hmm. the idea of you're going to continually be going in, first of all, for um, updates that are uh, experimental. Mm -hmm. And secondly, uh, I, I had a peek at the Neuralink, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, ecosystem mm -hmm. and what was glaring to me and, you know, I, looking at this from a neurotech mm -hmm. 
philosopher perspective is I would have really liked to see a little bit more prominence of bioethics, at, mm-hmm. you know, having a seat at the table during the inception design, you know, the, the conception process. Um, it, it, it strikes me as rather backwards thinking if mm-hmm. we create and then look at the impact, whereas we can learn from some of the wisdom. And you touched on this earlier Um, the oral traditions and the oral histories, what we're Mm -hmm. doing essentially is uploading a compendium of human knowledge Mm -hmm. into digital form. And if we think about Marshall McLuhan's work, uh, a notable um, uh, thinker in this space, highly Mm -hmm. recommend his book, Extensions um, of, of Man, and, you know, looking at how we are changing as a species. So when you don't have your phone with you, Mm a lot of people feel like they feel naked. You know, they feel like they're, mm-hmm. they're, they're, they're missing a part of themselves. And that changes how we've come to see ourselves, you know, if we look at digital humanities. And once we get into Web3, the metaverse, and the Internet of Things, augmented reality, you know, um, there's a fine line between being able to discern what is real, what is augmented, and the concerns about, you know, who is controlling the augmentation. So access to technology and the control behind it, because I think there's a wonderful, wonderful um, Disney series. I don't know if you've had a chance to see it. I highly recommend. It's called the 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 Benedict Society. The, the, I haven't. Oh. It, it's brilliant. It's for children, and mm-hmm. it's fascinating to explore. I'd love to see that in some sort of you know, um, uh, academic setting where mm-hmm. you know, they've had Simpsons courses where they you know mm-hmm. they they analyze the socio cultural aspect. I think that that Benedict Society looks at how um, technology can effectively be used as a form of mind control. Mm-hmm. So the algorithm can determine um, what you know what engages you, what keeps you on the screen mm-hmm. uh, uh, in our attention economy, because eyeballs on the screen is what translates into advertising dollars. Mm-hmm. And so if we're able to um, curate a feed that keeps you consistently engaged and coming back for the, for those neurochemical mm-hmm. hits, right? What humans love novelty. They love yeah. curiosity and we thrive on that. We crave it. And they've done studies with, with lab mice. And to mm-hmm. some extent, what I'm, what I'm thinking is we're conducting this enormous, you know, social experiment on ourselves and the entire world where we're um, essentially our own, lab rats. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's uh it's interesting if you look at the the cultural priming and pruning that happens in entertainment, Brendan. Uh for example, the Disney show, it's so far advanced in terms of the concepts that it's introducing to young children. And so I I wonder about whether that would potentially desensitize them or mm-hmm. normalize some of these things so that when it actually comes to be, you know, they're they're working in the impact of AI or the impact of AI mm-hmm. for business. Um, it, it, there's a sense of uh, apathetic blaséness of like, oh, I've, mm-hmm. I've seen it, it's been done, and let's move on. And I think that that breeds a, a certain complacency. I also think there's wonderful opportunities. So it's not all bad. There's a lot of really great um, opportunities. No worries. Um- What's really interesting when you touched on the fact that, to some extent, growing up in the technology, you're talking about Disney show and how you have organizations now really optimizing how to garner attention, but really attention of young people. I mean, the biggest thing you, you talk to anyone now are very common discourses around TikTok, how you know, this, when the bond was of seven seconds, that's the at- attention people have and how TikTok algorithms based on your location or algorithms on your Shorts feed may be based on, you know, we're trying to promote education to these group of people. So we're going to do more education type videos. The trueness behind that may or may not be right. It's very interesting. But at the same time, I think it's a very interesting always discourse to have or at least topic or to have discussion around because it's always the idea that the next generation is going to be worse off than the current one. It also is a little bit, I think, of the idea that no individual wants to say that my young 10-year-old knows more than me or has the ability to dis, you know, disseminate information greater. But the desensitization, I think, is a large issue as well. Now, 
I think it's always interesting or difficult to figure out where, how much that desensitization, uh, desensitization is because we, we always, I mean, me, even me growing up, video games were a big thing. They said, you know, GTA causes violence, violence in children. This is bad. You know, if you're playing shooting games, you're going to shoot someone. We haven't really seen that connect, although I do feel it doesn't prevent you from doing I do not think it's a hindrance if you do it virtually. I don't think it takes that same itch if you have violent tendencies. But I think it's always interesting to figure out where, where is that occurring. I think a lot of times the desensitization may not be as apparent as it seems. I know for a lot of people, when it comes to, you think, if, if you look at the research around this, being a very virtual age, you build relationships quicker online than you do in person. Due to the fact you have to overshare, due to a lack of physical connection, physical touch, it's a very interesting idea that you share more online and you become deeper friends with someone quicker. However, when it comes to in-person, I've, I've talked to many school teachers about this, even though they're communicating, I would say probably 10x more than they did in the past. Like growing up, I didn't have cell phone. I didn't text people nonstop. I mean, MSN was becoming around. They became a little more popular, yeah. but I wasn't texting nonstop. Now you have younger individuals communicating probably 20 hours a day, maybe a little more sleep, maybe 18 hours a day, but the communication skills are lacking. So you think hyper-socialized people would be hyper-social, more outgoing, but it's the complete opposite when you're behind the screen versus in person. So it's always interesting that, like you said, looking at being able to think about this saying, hey, where is this going? What are the impacts? Because like anything, you theorize and then in practice, things can change, but being able and being conscious of what are these changes in, are occurring and kind of what are the downstream impacts of this. One th thing that comes up a lot also, though, is the fact that semi touching on this, and this is same idea to some extent, was that with the, you talk a little bit about who owns the data and who owns the algorithm. There's a big issue now with, well, algorithms, they only can repeat what's done in the past. And this is mm -hmm. a lot of systematic ba biases, a lot of issues with policy, trying to use like, um, AI to do policies because history a lot of times isn't correct as we see a lot of changes occurring and a lot of copyright issues as well. How, where do you think, or how do you think you can pull up, I guess say not police that, but monitor that. So you're ensuring you're not constantly repeating issues of the past when to some sure. extent AI is just a really good algorithm that yeah. helps you repeat success from the past. Oh, absolutely. For the That's another great question. I think there's a couple of things I'd like to touch on mm -hmm. if it's okay. One of them is, you know, I think from, uh, I, I'm a parent and as a mom, mm -hmm. uh, I think, uh, um, uh, and I think you're a parent, you know, you're, you're, mm -hmm. you've got, uh, uh, Kona. And I think in mm -hmm. that sense, there's a sense of overwhelming joy and love and unconditional um, uh, wishes for mm -hmm. fulfillment and success and contentment. And so in a way, I, I slightly would offer a different perspective in terms mm -hmm. of future generations. I think they are faster. They are smarter. Mm -hmm. I worked in um, academia with young mm -hmm. uh, adults for 16 years and um, they think differently. They, they, they speak faster. Um, they connect ideas in a different way. And I think it's really wonderful to see. It's, 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 mm -hmm. it, it, it's a success for our generation if our future generations are better, wiser, smarter, kinder mm -hmm. um, than us. And I think in regard to your question, uh, going back to the, mm -hmm. you know, the original uh, purpose of the mm -hmm. internet and how it came to be, mm -hmm. um, having worked with, you know, uh, people who were um, kind of designing the future of where we're going and having presented at a conference earlier, um, n not too long ago, uh, where the keynote was uh, uh, the head of the US Air Force. Um, I think there's a lot of options for us to reimagine our futures and what it means to be human as a species, uh, especially as we explore off planet. Uh, there's a lot of investment, there's a lot of interest in off planet, uh, partly because of the potential for profit and for um, accessing resources. At the same time, I think it taps into an innate uh, human trait, which is to explore, to continually want to be 
um, looking at new frontiers. And I think this is a new frontier for us collectively as we venture into the internet um, of things, Web3, AR, VR, XR, uh, biotechnology, bioethics. And it's very exciting. And I think the question that you have about who owns the data and how do we safeguard against it? I think, you know, it's it's wishful thinking to think we can future-proof everything. Having um, offered some some courses and, and, and sessions for applications of AI, blockchain for businesses, um, practical applications, I think we, we just, I'm a huge advocate of embedding universal design into the conceptual architecture during the design phase. And what that means is um, if we look at biomimicry, for example, we know that diversity, uh, especially on boards with women and, and diverse people, yeah, it drives profits and it, it, it provides an opportunity for um, covering some of our blind spots in puzzle learning. In the same regard, if we look at the homogeneity of the digital aristocracy, so um, a few other tidbits. I'm not sure if you, uh, yeah, I, I, you might, you might know about Facebook, right? It started as a way of um, rating women, women's mm-hmm. attractiveness on college campuses. So that's the impetus. Yeah. I mean, it was born of that. Um, YouTube uh, it used to be called TuneIn, uh, and uh, TuneIn, and uh, I've forgotten the. Um, it's on my, one of my slides, but originally as a dating app right? For videos. And so the impetus of these things came from ideas born of a homogenous group. And that's where I get Mm -hmm. into um, exploring a little bit uh, what tech culture, tech bro culture might mean from Silicon Mm -hmm. Valley. And now as we see um, our our growing global population and emerging um, geopolitical Mm -hmm. um, culture wars, I think we're also going to see algorithmic wars and uh, we're going to see the opportunity for um, reimagining what relational networks means. Mm-hmm. So moving away from competitive um, mindsets to a more collaborative uh, you know, ethos that allows us to see, okay, you know what? If we're focused, our company is looking at producing X, Y, Z. XYZ is reliant on, you know, certain minerals and and mining, um, and our supply chain is an interconnected system, then we venture into systems thinking. And the systems thinking is integral. It's, it's, it's critical for us to think um, in that way, uh, if we'd like to be relevant, and, um, you know, move our businesses along in the 21st century. Otherwise, we face obsolescence. A lot of the companies that we see today will not survive. And why? Uh, Part of it is, I think, um, you know, clinging on to uh, holding on really tightly to old Mm -hmm. paradigms, thinking what's worked in the past will continue to work in the future, whereas the context is changing, the environment has changed. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, we have language extinction happening, uh, where there is, you know, um, uh, a need for including different perspectives that have been historically perhaps either been intentionally effaced or Mm -hmm. disregarded. And I think we're seeing that in the world of business, in the world of sports. We're not quite at the peak of it, but it starts with this awareness with what you're doing, Brendan. Mm -hmm. I think you're you're an example of Mm -hmm. the next generation where you have this podcast and the guests that Mm -hmm. you bring on, the topics that you're interested in, what you're doing is you're you're like a little not a little but you're you're like a bee you're like a big bee mm-hmm. <laughs> you're you know you're cross pollinating ideas and with Hollow Art Collective that's the uh, recent initiative that I've um, launched with artists around the world it, it, it's the same thing we're little bees and we're little bees cross pollinating ideas and creativity across continents with this shift in mindset to say hey, we have machine learning and AI and Mm -hmm. and technology. It's not an us versus them. It's a let's do it together. And it's the first one that is giving um, artificial intelligence holding space to say Mm -hmm. we have an avatar. 
that's the SEO algorithm. That's mm-hmm. the, you know, a- and acknowledging that presence. And uh, that brings me to the question of, I- I'm curious to know what your thoughts are. Mm-hmm. Um, artificial general intelligence in terms of consciousness. And do you think that we might be able to, you know, move into sentience or is that a pie in the sky dream? Mm-hmm. The Ray Kurzweil's, the Peter Diamandis's mm-hmm. of the world who are looking at longevity and how do we prolong human life can we upload our consciousness and then how does that translate into transcendental meditation mm-hmm. in different ways of being with each other it's a lot so <laughs> yeah no that's what you touched on which is really funny because when I, I was speaking to years ago to i forget what they found they're one of the first dating apps uh, back in the day i think it was on phone on telephone 1-800 number style dating so they were they were i think in their 50s talking about they created this back in their 20s was very interesting. They they told me we were asking about questions like, you know, oh, where do you see the you know dating changing? Kind of what's going on? This is when Tinder started to yeah. really blow up. And what he said, and er- I see this everywhere now. He said every single thing, every social platform turns into a dating app at the end of the day. That is the goal of every social platform. And I'm like, that's a very g- general, broad statement. You know, I'm using LinkedIn. LinkedIn's not a dating app, although we've seen now I failed date. LinkedIn's becoming almost a Facebook, <laughs> much more social, much more thing. Facebook has launched a dating app within Facebook. So something you're saying, like thinking about or seeing history repeat itself. This was one piece of advice that's been over 15 years old now that has stuck with me that anytime you build a social platform, it all goes back to the basic thing of how humans can connect with humans and become a dating application. So when you were touching on, that's how kind of Facebook started to some extent for rating people. And now almost went full circle to now meeting your significant other through Facebook. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, it's always funny how, no matter how advanced we get, human nature is human nature at the end of the day. Evolutionary um, and, biology, mm-hmm. right? E- exactly. And I think that's one of the things you even see in the text, tech space is that there's a lot of effort to try to change or be different. And it is true. There is already different norms and processes, but at the end of the day, humans always kind of want the same thing. So like you said, using technology to exemplify that or augment it. So it's familiar yet new at the same time. And, and you asked me a good, really interesting question around human consciousness within technology. I have, I've had f- few lectures on this funny enough, and I think we get to a almost another question I'm answering your question with a question to some extent, the classic. Um, but it becomes whether the answer is yes or no, would you know the difference? So if someone else has, you know, moved their consciousness online with AI and how much information is online, you could easily create an avatar that looks lifelike speech to some extent is the same and intonations and the way they speak can be mirrored very accurately. So, is there is it consciousness that I mean Turing test is no longer accurate? They you know Turing test has been thrown out because people have disproven it. But it becomes if it's indiscernible between a real human and a fake human, is it conscious? I think it becomes a challenge where it's like if it, if this world's a simulation, then the question is does it matter because you can't tell the difference that you think it is. But I think it's one of those interesting thought experiments and spirals is that it becomes an almost interesting thing. I mean, Black Mirror is always common talking about this has become well, once that occurs and once you can have a, to some extent, indistinguishable person, chat AI bot or a, you know, a relative of the past come back and you can have conversations with them to help mourning or help having that conversation. Well, then what, what does that become? Is that, then you, yeah. you have to add rights to that in the sense that even though it in today's terms, not a real person, but there is real impact. There is Absolutely. real. So I think it's an interesting I, thing. I, I love that, Brendan. And I think it's great that you mentioned, you know, Black Mirror. Uh, mm-hmm. And yeah, I'm not sure if you're aware of the mm-hmm. uh, global sci-fi. It's a bit dystopian dust that's mm-hmm. available on. I've on heard about that. I haven't seen No. Oh yeah, they they they're inviting filmmakers from around the world to mm-hmm. to submit shorts, and some of the stuff is mm-hmm. brilliant. I'll send you some, and perhaps mm-hmm. we can add some of the links because I think mm-hmm. they're they're again, you know, priming and pruning, and one of the um and and the really social commentaries of our time and how technology is changing, uh, human communities and human communication mm-hmm. as you as as you as you suggested earlier, um, 
I think one of the things that we might it, it would behoove us to think about mm-hmm. is to look at what um, what would be uh, it doesn't have to be utopian, but mm-hmm. what would be the the lighter version of black mirror so perhaps mm-hmm. a, a, a insert your color choice there's different color mm-hmm. preferences in different um, countries so mm-hmm. you know what would be a lighter uh, version mm-hmm. and I think the other the other part of it is you know looking at our language uh, the color the, the terminology the subconscious um, unconscious bias mm-hmm. around black uh, with with mm-hmm. dark matter you know dark black mm-hmm. is always seeing this duality that we have in mm-hmm. star wars and sci-fi that's very simplified it's a dichotomy and if we can transcend that and move into this um uh quantum understanding mm-hmm. there's a fascinating book i highly recommend it's called um the laboratory of the mind and it was referred to me by the head of innovation at cern uh, in mm-hmm. switzerland and he's uh he, he's a brilliant um scientist and i think part of what we need to do and what the endeavor with hollow art is to look at the uh, links between art and science. So creativity in the scientific method and why this is important is because if we're looking at theoretical physics, um, you know, understanding our cosmos, what, what's out there um, and exoplanets that are being discovered, there's potential for, for life form water. I think what we, what we, what would, be really great for us to look at is how we create and innovate scientifically because theoretical physicists are really using their imagination and their creativity. Mm-hmm. And so when we talk about the skill set and how people are changing, you're absolutely right. Um, there are courses now for young people to learn how to talk to each other. There's certain countries where they, you know, um, adults have not had any relations with people, uh, you know, intimately. And so there's coaches and, and um, those are concerns for the long term impact. Uh, one on human population, um, fecundity rates, and then the other piece mm-hmm. on what will the future human society look like and what will be those coveted skills in terms of negotiation, mediation, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, conflict resolution, and why I talk about these culture wars and um, uh, algorithmic Mm -hmm. wars is if we are able to potentially envision a different path. So um, Mm -hmm. uh, opening the door to solar punk that's another movement that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. I think um, the solar punk movement of looking at what would be an alternative future? And I, I've created some NFTs, uh, Brendan, mm-hmm. one is a red pill, blue pill, looking at mm-hmm. the future is ours to imagine, right? So what are we able to imagine? What do we allow ourselves to imagine? And the power of the mind and the power of thought and collective thought and how is our attention being directed? And I think these are some of the responsibilities of the people who are architecting our technology Mm -hmm. to move away from that sensationalist, you know, let's look at all the the terrible things that are happening. And perhaps we can dedicate some time to be still. Um, There's certain cultures that have quiet sitting. So 10 minutes Mm -hmm. of sitting a day, not necessarily mindfulness, but even breathing, taking pause, our posture, allowing our organs, you know, understanding that we're Mm -hmm. organic matter and having this opportunity for our technology, like your chair, you know, ergonomically mm-hmm. allowing you, but then h- how do you a- achieve flow? How do you get mm-hmm. into that peak performance? And can you imagine if we all tried to move toward a collective peak performance? Um, I don't really care about what your politics are, your economics, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it's, 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 that's less of an issue because once you hit some of those top um, uh, waves I guess Mm -hmm. there's an understanding that um, has been, I think, imprinted in ancient sages and Mm -hmm. wisdoms and around the world that really we are one. Uh, And and I'm not talking about the kumbaya, let's sit around Mm -hmm. a fireplace and, you know, let's all be happy together, but really understanding that the face of God is in everyone that you see. And what Mm -hmm. that means is something I think that allows for transformation on a spiritual, on a on a very personal level, it's a turning mm-hmm. inward that technology um, doesn't necessarily allow for because it's a platform where it's constantly 
outward facing, you know, yeah. uh, is this okay that I posted? Is it okay that I said that? Is this person, mm-hmm. you know, there's a lot of internal talk, external talk. And that's the piece where I think we're changing the way, um, the, the space time. And, and mm-hmm. what I mean by that, uh, Brendan is way back when the internet was born, you would post something right on a discussion board. Mm-hmm. People would have time to reflect. There was no need for immediate response. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Right. And there is a different process in terms of engaging with one another. Now it's mm-hmm. immediate. It's text. And so when I speak about Marshall McLuhan, what I'm really trying to um, emphasize here is that the medium is the message. And what's fascinating is once we get into that augmented reality, um, mm-hmm. the, the bioethics of having chips implanted, you know, there's countries in, in, in Europe where, um, they've already started. It's been many, many years. Mm-hmm. They've put chips in employees, um, uh, hands, uh, mm-hmm. where if they want access, you know, you're, you're, mm-hmm. and that, that sci-fi reality is happening. And so my question is, what are some, um, uh, how do we cultivate hope in sci-fi? Uh, realities of the future. Um, Mm -hmm. One last piece that I think is really interesting in the art world is um, Mm -hmm. there's this movement in a lot of museums and and galleries and curators where we're looking at, you know, for example, Indo-futurism, right? Mm -hmm. So trying to reimagine some of these ancient pieces or um, there's all um, Mm Afro-futurism and how that is changing the tenet of... um, really the essence of, of what those things meant. Uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is how history is being reimagined, mm-hmm. reinterpreted and reinvented. Yep. And Donald Huffman, um, Hoffman uh, has a proposition that uh, the truth always goes extinct, right? Mm. The, uh, mm-hmm. It's always the, uh, the, the, the people who write history are the people who were the vankers. And mm-hmm. so, the, you know, my question to, to you and, and to everybody is, what type of history do we want to write when we look back 20 years from now? Um, and, and are we conscious that we are creating history in this moment with AI mm-hmm. and art and creativity? Um, because the concern is, if we enter those technology bubbles, we might also be mm-hmm. limiting our creativity. If we lose touch with reality, if, if, if we have young people, which is increasingly the case, who prefer to be in a digital state, um, mm-hmm. uh, gaming, uh, connecting with friends online, then being outdoors. And so outdoor education, you know, the importance of, um, uh, are we... Uh, brains and vats connected mm-hmm. to each other electronically or are we yeah. really and it becomes philosophical to some extent and existential mm-hmm. so sorry that was a little bit long-winded you got no, me going there. That, no that, that was great i think one thing you touched on is advice i always give is go stare at trees more often i mean i was um i spent a few months in japan working at a bonsai nursery so i spent a lot of time staring at trees and one of the best advice I always hear from older people or anyone, even people who have high grade success are very tacky. When you ask them how they recharge, it's go sit in nature, calm down, like you said, disconnect, meditate. Now, meditation could be working out, going for a run, doing something else, but turning off your mind and really connecting and um, touching grass or like being able to really enjoy nature always seems to come back to it. No matter how technological you get, it's always the idea that there is something stoic or ingrained within human nature to find peace in staring at staring at a tree so that's the advice i always hear is just go stare at trees and sit outside on grass i have a Um, question for you brendan um mm -hmm. about your bonsai experience i'm fascinated by that and the japanese have you know forest Mm -hmm. bathing and that's becoming um increasingly popular there's insurance companies now Mm -hmm. who will um you know uh promote the the well-being factor of mm-hmm. being in nature. So that's, you know, a doctor can prescribe, go out and be mm-hmm. in nature. A doctor can prescribe, mm-hmm. go to an art gallery. Um, mm-hmm. What what was your biggest takeaway from, from working and pruning bonsai? Mm-hmm. So biggest takeaway, and this is probably more of a takeaway on the difference in Japanese culture. And I would say when I was in Japan, it was the most unique place I've been 
for mm-hmm. being such a economic powerhouse on that on that sense. Um, the biggest difference is the idea of having a lifelong purpose, even if it's small. And that's, I mean, yeah. that contributes obviously to longevity. But when I was talking to someone there, he was a, um, he was their intern or their apprentice. That's the word apprentice. Mm-hmm. It's six year, it's five years and you give a year back for free, unpaid. He gets one day off every two months and he's expected to work seven to 11 every single day, 7 a.m. to 11 every single day, no days off. Yeah. He can't smoke, have a girlfriend. He can't party. He can't drink. They all kind of do, but it's the idea that you can, your whole life is dedicated this for five years, mm-hmm. unpaid. And then six years, you're so grateful you give it your back. And I asked them how, wh- why, like you go in North America and the idea is if I don't get a promotion in three months, I'm quitting my job. How, how do you have such a big shift? Mm-hmm. And his, his conversation was the fact that when he saw this bonds and master doing his thing, he saw that there's respect that a lot of people enjoyed the art form. So his dedication is into perfecting something that's impossible to perfect and getting joy of that journey, realizing mm-hmm. that he's progressing to a near impossible thing. Um, and it, it is weird. Cause I always say that there's no such thing as work-life balance, work-life balance, how most people understand it is incorrect. The number of hours you work rarely dictate your happiness. Um, mm-hmm. it's more the fact of when you go home at night, do you have energy? Do you have are you happy with the day you spent? So that's a big thing. And even if you look at literature, a big thing also um, talking about family is that they looked at even children. They said, um, do, did parents who work longer hours have, did it negatively affect their kids? And they, and there was no, to some extent. The idea was that the biggest difference in uh, children was the fact that when a parent came home, if they had energy to play with them, if they had conversations with them, that was a larger impact than the number of hours they had home. And you see this, you have people who may work mm-hmm. jobs that they only work a few hours a day. They're miserable. They go home, don't spend time with their mm-hmm. kids, don't care about their family or miserable all day. Working less is not going to help them. Getting fulfillment is. So in a roundabout way, the biggest thing I learned was finding fulfillment and the amount of progression you can have is so much greater because it's not money. It's about something deeper than that. And that kind of kind of goes back to the idea that purpose is the most important thing and talk to anyone who's had great success. It's finding that purpose as quickly as possible, but really enjoying the process. Brendan, that's wisdom Mm -hmm. right there. That's uh, brilliant. And it's a, it's a golden nugget that Mm -hmm. I think is a, Mm -hmm. is a wonderful place to pause and just, Mm -hmm. you know, sit with what you've shared. I think it's really, really important for, uh, where we are now. And I love that you, Mm -hmm. uh, you, you were able to articulate it in such a beautiful way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it is. If you haven't visited Japan, it's very interesting. Um, oh, it's beautiful. And it's like anything else visiting and going to new places, like you said, op- really opens up your perspective. And that kind of goes back to the idea that if it's a digital world, is there more perspectives or is there less because there's a kind of convergence to the norm or convergence to the center is always a kind of interesting topic. Absolutely. And Japan in and of mm-hmm. itself as an eco innovation system, I think mm-hmm. ecosystem is really fascinating to explore from a business case study. I think mm-hmm. one of the coolest things that I've gleaned from my travels to Japan mm-hmm. is, you know, looking at the differences between Kyoto and uh, Osaga mm-hmm. and um, Tokyo mm-hmm. and the homogen- homogeneity. Uh, conformity, Mm -hmm. but also the opportunity for outliers to uh, integrate Mm -hmm. in terms of Harajuku or anime or Magna Mm -hmm. and, Mm -hmm. um, you know, the Michelin starred, uh, I I dream of Niji or see, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the sushi Mm -hmm. um, uh, film around uh, the art. And it's really this, this purpose driven life that I think is at the core of many spiritual practices and also Mm -hmm family offices, you know, in terms of building legacies, the mm-hmm. ones that sustain, um, the ones that are, um, you know, even in business and in, in anything that you do, um, if you have that purpose-driven uh, values-based mm-hmm. existence, I think the rest follows. And I love how you tied it to parenting and, and mm-hmm. children. Um, it's, it's, I think that there's also an opportunity for us, Brendan, um, to have a hold space to listen mm-hmm. more to people like yourself. 
to, to really engage in dialogue with people who are different than us um, mm-hmm. and to learn collectively together. So mm-hmm. thank you. Mm-hmm. No, and thank you. This has been a great conversation, I think. And I think one way would be good to end it off, um, if you can summarize what I'm about to ask in, in a few words, because this is, this is a loaded question um, to some extent, but obviously a lot is constantly changing. Um, the new frontier is really at this point, the bleeding edge. There's a lot of innovation, a lot of different directions this can go. How do you stay up to date with everything? How do you know where to spend your time? Because it's almost like the world is literally an, bigger than an oyster. It's multiple oysters. How do you know where to focus or how do you are you able to keep yourself learning or at least continuing being at that innovative edge? I so love this question. It's such mm-hmm. a, it, it's such a, it's brilliant. I, I love, love this question, Brendan. And I think um, the first answer I have, you know, off the bat is I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. <laughs> and I sometimes feel like I'm a whirling dervish, you know, juggling mm-hmm. a bunch of stuff, turning around and somehow it all kind of ends up coming together. Um, I think coming back to what you said, the purpose in terms of mm-hmm. what, what, makes me feel engaged and purposeful mm-hmm. and alive. I, I, I love quantum physics, neuroscience, you know, learning about astrophysics and, and mm-hmm. theoretical physics, the future of um, how humans evolve spiritually, collectively. Mm-hmm. The key mm-hmm. takeaways for me, Brendan, would be um, hanging around children. That's mm-hmm. been really important to bring me back to the basics and ask questions. Mm-hmm. Like my daughter the other day, she's seven. She, she, we were, we created a diorama and I'll share that with mm-hmm. you uh, at a later date. It's really mm-hmm. cool. Um, and it was out of boxes, right? Like mm-hmm. she's got every toy <laughs> and we ended up playing with a box. Yeah. And as we're playing and she's creating these things, she, she turned to me and out of the blue said, you know, mom, why do we value money? <laughs> you know, all these brilliant questions. Um, and then hanging around, I have a lot of friends who are, you know, um, over 80, over 90. Mm-hmm. And then the end of, you know, the end of that um, part of the journey in terms of looking at um, what made for a good life. Um, mm-hmm. And the final piece is, you know, as we become more of aware of our bodies, mm-hmm. we get a sense of internal vibrations, frequencies, and peace. And so mm-hmm. when we're around um, and we can sense intuitively um, people who share the same kind of um, creative energy, who, who mm-hmm. push us to become better, who are smarter than us. I love being around people who are smarter than me because I learn. I, mm-hmm. You know, that's, that's, that's a key piece. And then getting, um, getting into that state of flow, practicing, being alone and practicing being mm-hmm. with other people, I think those would be some some pillars that I think help mm-hmm. determine what to focus on because you're right, we're entering a data tsunami. It's really mm-hmm. an onslaught of there's just so much information and it's being generated so incredibly fast. I think mm-hmm. finding some of those, um, you know, thought leaders in whatever mm-hmm. industry you're interested in and, um, Creating a, a, a discipline, a habit of, you know, um, booking time in your calendar mm-hmm. for, for discovery. I don't know if you do this. I imagine you might. Um, mm-hmm. One of the things I always uh, um, advocate for is booking a day a month to explore, not having any mm-hmm. agenda and just, you know, looking at what can I, what do I feel yeah. like learning today? Um, you know, the other day I learned about cotton and the origins mm-hmm. of um, purple ink that's pulled mm-hmm. from snails and the dying mm-hmm. art and craftsmanship. And so, you know, there's an opportunity for exploring uh, the unknowns. Um, mm-hmm. The other thing I think that's important is embracing um new experiences. So Mm -hmm. if you are, you know, traveling to work, for example, or Mm -hmm. going for a walk, uh, Robert Frost's poem of, you know, the path uh, less taken, it's, it's, it's really fun to experiment with uh, different ways of doing Mm -hmm. the same thing. And what that opens us up to is the possibility of um, seeing innovation in a different light, 
where can people follow you, learn more, kind of learn more about your story or projects you're a part of? What would be good links to share with them? Well, thank you for asking. Um, there's a number of ways. LinkedIn is one and hollowartcollective.com. Um, is another. Uh, I'm happy to share some links. I've also written some children's mm-hmm. books that I'm very excited to share uh, mm-hmm. in the coming uh, in the coming months. Um, and there's uh, there you know, I think one of the things I'd love to leave your audience with is looking inward mm-hmm. and really focusing on that process of self awareness and introspection, mm-hmm. which I think you exemplify in your interviews in the way that you ask questions. And so really thinking about, you know, who is it that you'd like to become? Who is it that you're mm-hmm. becoming? And uh, I'm always open to connect with people. So if you're interested in anything I've shared today and you'd like to learn more, feel free to reach out. Um, hollowartcollective.com. I'll mm-hmm. be launching a couple of other uh, websites um, this year, and there's a there's a I think uh, an opportunity for us to collectively create a quantum poem, and and to really write the future together.